Thank you, Sergeant Boss, for being here. When I spoke to a colleague and knew that you all were um, very excited to be able to be part of this conversation, and I was very encouraged by that. One thing I do want to point out, um, several months ago when we were planning a completely different event, we were um, discussing a group uh, in town called Gideon's Army, and they wrote a report called Driving Law Block. And as we were thinking about, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but and I'm sure you are too. And the thing that struck me about that conversation was not necessarily the merit of the research, or not necessarily what was being discussed in that report, but the fact that it, in that moment, I realized my own privilege. Not white privilege, because I know, Alberto, you hate that word, so I'm just going to use privilege. But this, no, I did not grow up being afraid of the police. I have been stopped by the police on several occasions, and I was not afraid. In fact, when I was commuting to Bowling Green for a period of my life, I was stopped twice at 5 o'clock in the morning in the dark, and I was not afraid. And it gave me a realization that, okay, this is not the experience of many people in our community who are afraid of the police. Um, particularly minority communities for a variety of reasons, and I'm not blaming you for those. But I do think that that's an important part of this discussion, and something that I would like everybody to respond to. How do we um, recognize that there are communities that we want to consider, and who are our neighbors, who do not have as amicable of relationships with law enforcement officials? And here's now what you're um, It's kind of difficult to follow all this. <laughs> um, uh, just wonderful stories of, of people doing work at the local level. So at the Department of Homeland Security, we have a saying that says, Homeland Security is hometown security. And uh, because at the end of the day, if you want to build resilience and protect society, you have to do it at the local level. And what, as I was listening to the panel here, what I reflected on was something really interesting that I want to bring up. I, if you were here for the earlier part of the discussion, it was all about criticism and critique and no real solutions. And that was part of that. Uh, we provided no real solutions. This panel has been all about solutions and have, has been light on critique and criticism um, of the different uh, uh, components that are involved in keeping us safe and secure. And I think that goes a lot, that goes a long way in, in talking about what it means to have hometown security. Because what we've tried to do in the department, at the Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, we, we, what we're trying to do is have our employees at DHS and our officials, no matter what they're working on, to understand security, from a broader perspective. Security is not just about securing a facility, um, prevent, uh, um, capturing the bad guy, preventing the crime. It's about building resilience in society. It's about a society that takes into consider consideration all the unfortunate realities of having to have extra protection at a synagogue, um, at a mosque, at a temple, um, having to unfortunately have extra security at a um, concert, uh, like in Las Vegas. Those, those aspects of, sec of security are important, and we will continue to do, and we will con continue to, uh, to, in to empower local law enforcement to be able to have the resources and the tools to do all of that. But the broader aspect of security is ensuring resiliency at the local level, especially as um, as you go through uncertain times. Um, we at the department have, uh, have a small group that goes out and engages various communities in, 18, in over 18 cities across the country. And so this team goes and holds roundtables with local communities, with local law enforcement, with, uh, with local government. And you know, throughout every, what we've noticed, every time there's a political transition that happens, people feel uncertain. And what we try to do, what we've tried to do, is tell folks to have, number one, to have effective resiliency and security at the local level, you have to have relationships. And I think what I heard today reinforces that. 
if you have positive relationships, if you're able to engage, even if you don't agree. So I think this is the main point that unfortunately we don't understand at the national level, that people do so much better at the local level. I don't have to fully agree with you. I can understand that there might be things that you do that are problematic, or I do that's, that's problematic, but we can work together towards finding common resolutions. We can un understand that there's historical precedences, that there's historical injustices, but how do we have those conversations where we're able to sit down and take care of the now, where we're able to address the issues that we're dealing with today. And I think a lot of times we get stuck in the, in, in the broader conversations, but what, and, and that we do that at the, at the national level. You see it from politicians, you see it from the national conversation all the time. But at the local level, uh, I mean, you know, there was a whole critique of the FBI uh, in our first session and its tactics and, uh, um, and engagement with certain communities, but you just heard a success story as well. And there's a lot of those success stories across the country where if you have those relationships, I don't have to fully agree with all, everything that you do, but when it comes time to the time, when it comes to this, I'm able to engage you because I have a relationship with you. And I think that is, that's what we try to uh, put out, and that's what I heard this, uh, this afternoon it works. Number two is the issue of trust. And this is something that we have a deficit of in the government. We have a deficit of trust with citizens. We understand that. And part of why I do not like, um, and, I, and I said this earlier, like constantly labeling everything as government is that citizens eventually will continue to lose trust. And that's the, and if you get to a place where you don't trust your government at all, I mean, it's okay to have an, in, uh, uh, an inherent distrust of authority and government. We're Americans, we're taught that as, as young people. We, that's something that we just are inherently taught. Don't trust everything that the government says, that's fine. But if you lose all confidence and all trust and think that every aspect of government, no matter where it is, it's local, if it's law enforcement, if it's local, if it's state, if it's federal, if everyone is wrong and everyone does not deserve my trust, then you eventually create schisms in society that other people can take advantage of and increase our divisions. And we see that happening now. And so, number one, relationships, and number two, trust. And trust is hard, I mean, because we're government and we have all sorts of security issues that we deal with, we have all sorts of threats that we deal with, at times we're going to unfortunately not be able to have the full trust of, the, of, of, of communities. But what we, I think what we're trying to do at the very local level, beyond just the political right rhetoric, at like the governance level, at the level of you know, our PSAs, our protective security advisors at the local level who work with synagogues, who work with churches, who work with mosques, who work with critical infrastructure, to, allow, to help them build that trust so that kind of some of the national political conversations um, uh, are not as impactful when it comes to the local. So the Tennessee Holocaust Commission has a training program for our Metro National Police Department and they go through a course of study and it's actually housed at, um, part of it is at the JCC, the Jewish Training Center. Um, we just heard from some of the uh, graduates of that program about how impactful it is for them. They use the Holocaust as a way, it's time and distance from Nashville allows us to look at it a little differently. Um, Police officers go to this program to understand how regular, normal police, police officers in Germany were able to be turned into Nazi killers. People who would never have been like that before. How did it happen to them? And so part of what the Tennessee Holocaust Commission is able to do is use that story to teach our police officers how to deal with people who may not look like them or believe like them or pray like them or live like them in order to have a, a sensitivity to that situation so that they recognize people, even different people, as human, right, as people. So I think that is one of the training uh, things that the police department is doing um, to become more culturally sensitive, but also to understand that they have a great deal of power and that they have to respect that as well as we as the citizens have to respect that power too.
too. So I, I just wanted to make that aware that that is happening, and that's not the only sensitive, sensitivity training and diversity training that's happening, but I think it's remarkable. Sandra Martin, could you tell us, as somebody in your position, what would you want more of in order to be successful in your job, and what it is that you're trying to do in terms of forming connections with you know, all kinds of communities in Nashville? Well, what I was thinking earlier about the question that you posed about uh, Gideon's Army and, and those topics. Uh, the first thing that came to mind was recruiting. Uh, you want your police department to, to mirror uh, the community. Uh, so, uh, and that, uh, that message goes out all the time. Uh, you know, uh, the chief goes to a lot of meetings and he says we're hiring every day. So, I think, uh, if we can get uh, different backgrounds to to join the police department, I think it, you can kind of grow and adapt from the inside out. You know, you, you when you work alongside another person, maybe of a different background, different culture, you can't help but uh, grow closer to them and have a better understanding of maybe where they're coming from. So uh, you know. Uh, Police work, especially patrol officers that work the street every day, uh, develop a very uh, intense bond with, with their partners and other officers that work within their districts. And uh, that was kind of the first thing that came to mind was uh, encourage the community, if you have any interest at all, if you know anybody with any, any interest in law enforcement, whether it be local police department, uh, you know, federal, uh, federal uh, law enforcement job, or homeland security, uh, whatever, but I think, um, you know, I don't know, I can't speak as to how specifically we could do a better job at maybe recruiting. Uh, I know our recruiting unit goes out a lot and, and, and puts on uh, shows and displays at various events, but I think that's something that uh, would definitely help the police department from the inside is to, to mirror the community and the 